how you went back and recreated your version of 54. The recreation of the recreation? Yes. Okay, so the, so the 54 director's cut, right? Yep. Um, so uh, this, I, I had cobbled together something out of various video sources, um, VHS really, a VHS copy um, that existed in 1998. And that's the thing that played at Outfest that I think um, Brian mentioned. But we didn't really have an EDL, which is then an edit decision list, which allows you to go back into the negative, because this was shot on film negative. So 17 years later, with negatives spread out literally all over the world, in the US and Canada, and various warehouses, we had to gather that together and somehow cut the 40 new minutes back in. Um, without an EDL list, it's almost impossible unless you can find the VHS dailies or rushes as you call them. There's really no reason to keep VHS dailies. They degrade, you throw them out. But for some reason, Miramax had kept them. So my post-production supervisor, Nancy Valley, was crawling around a warehouse in 90 degrees outside of LA this summer, and she found a giant pallet shrink-wrapped of VHS dailies with signs all around it marked to be destroyed. So if she hadn't found that pallet that day, there'd be no director's cut. Amazing. Also, and I wanted to say something also about the restoration of this. It wasn't just restoring the story and all the sexuality and decadence and all of that fun stuff, but it was the restoration of the look of the movie. In 1998, when they transferred it, they blew all this light into it. So if you watch it in Netflix, it looks sort of like it's noon when you go in the club. So it was very important to me to bring it back down to its darkness. And my um, DP, Alexander Gruzinski, who we nicknamed the Prince of Darkness, or the second Prince of Darkness, did such a fabulous job because to shoot dark on negative is extremely difficult. It's much easier on video now. And he did a great job and we you know, invented a lot of ways to use Kino flows and even bubbles and glitter to you know, reflect the light so that we could, so that you could experience the nightclub as I think we all experience when we go inside a nightclub, which is it's a very dark place and you get it in flashes of light. So I was thrilled to restore it to its darkness. A key thing are the performances of your three principals. Can you tell us how they came on board and in which order? Uh, yeah, so the order is probably not what you would think. Um, so uh, uh, first was Brecken Meyer, believe it or not, who plays Greg, uh, the busboy. And I think part of that is he was so perfect. Also up for the part was Mark Ruffalo, who I loved very much. Do you guys know him now? Yes? Okay, so he plays the friend. He plays Rico. This is what his first movie role, or his first um, one that got attention. I found him in a theater in, um, on 40, a small theater on 42nd Street. But I cast Brecken first because his character is really sort of the heart of the movie, even though Shane is the soul in the viscera of the movie. And so it started with Brecken. A year later came Ryan. It took me a year to cast these. And then Salma. Um, I needed to cast a Latina, and it was very difficult. We really had two choices in Hollywood, and um, I got my choice, so I'm thrilled. And Miramax helped me with that as well. And your subsidiary casting, the, the famous people that flit in and out, um, I mean, it's an amazing array of people. Was it easy to get people? I think, you know, once we got this cast, once it started building, actually Mike Myers came to us. You know, that part we knew was sort of the plum role to cast, and we couldn't agree on anything, Miramax and me. And I, you know, this is, this is my first feature, by the way, and I had, you know, very few first-time directors would have dug their heels in like I did, but I did, for whatever reason. And um, finally, Mike came to us, and we had a great lunch, and it all worked out. So I think that as that was kind of building, um, people started coming to us, and th then we got Lauren Hutton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I can't even remember what the subsidiary character uh, others are, but they would sort of Michael come Michael York away. is a My key one yeah. for the British audience, I think. Yeah. Well, and key for me, because... So Michael York stars in this movie called Cabaret. Any fans? Okay. So the prototype for this film was Cabaret. It's about this world on edge that's about to collapse, this sort of decadent world, and at the heart of it, a love triangle. So that was sort of in writing. That was a movie I watched a lot. And then when it came time to shoot, I had a sp everyone on my crew um, 
especially my DP, watch the movie again and again. And there are, are a couple of homages that we pay to the movie. Uh, one is casting Michael York, and it was fabulous, taking him aside whenever I had him on set to tell me stories about the shooting of Cabaret, none of which I'll repeat here. Um, but also there is the dinner scene, which we shot like when, when they're in the castle of the Baron, is, is he the Baron in Cabaret? Yeah, so when they shoot that dinner scene in the castle, we, we were shooting it the same sort of way, like through the china, um, the same sort of table. The way Anita laughs, ha <laughs> ha is, is an homage to Sally Bowles, the Liza Minnelli character. Um, also, the scene where the three of them are dancing uh, and taking drugs and drinking red wine on um, Christmas, we we shot it shot for shot as the, like that scene in Cabaret um, in the castle afterwards when they're drunk and they're all about to have sex. So um, we shot it shot for shot. I'm not sure that we edited it shot for shot, though. So part of the difficulty of bringing the film out at the time was maybe the world didn't feel itself ready for this amount of man-on-man -man action or, or drugs. Um, did you feel at the time that you were ahead of your time? Um, was it a surprise that it didn't go quite the way you wanted it to? Um, I didn't feel like I was ahead of my time, but I was a, um, you know, a, a young, innocent, um, indie New York filmmaker. But when you're releasing a movie on 1800 screens, you know, in a big way, then it was indeed of, in head, ahead of its time. And I think, what, uh, you know, there, there are the points that Brian brings up, but also there's this point of flawed characters. So we had a lead character who isn't always likable. He's a bisexual opportunist. Now, I love that, right? And, and now the world loves that, especially because of American television, which really likes complex, flawed characters. Compared to who we have on TV right now in the US, he's, you know, a bunny. But in 1998, there was this thing that, uh, you know, a large release had to have really likable characters at its heart. Not true anymore. And did you always have in your mind the wish to bring out a director's cut? Because it's a long, it's a big gap, it's a big gap, and uh, what was the impetus for you to start getting the VHSs out? Hmm. I never got them out, they just found their way out there. I don't know how it happened. Um, well, so the thing, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I knew I had made a good movie so that was probably the biggest impetus, or I felt I had, and, and, and I would hope you agree, and it's, that's why this has all been so thrilling. Um, so that was just a sort of internal thing that somehow I wanted audiences to be able to see this. And um, it had changed so much, and I didn't recognize that movie really anymore. I really wanted this story to come out, and so, uh, what was, am I answering your question? Sort so. of. Um, I mean, it, must, it takes a lot of effort to make a film. Right. And I imagine a lot, e almost equal effort to, to remake Harder, film. harder. Uh, and the, <laughs> the restoration. Um. Yes, so in a way, making it a second time was more difficult than making it the first time. Um, even though the first time had 400 extras and movie stars and you know I was brand new to all of this, the second time was so difficult in part because of the actual restoration process. But, you know, over 17 years, my wonderful producer, Jonathan King, um, who uh, really stuck with this movie, he and I would sort of continually bug Miramax over the 17 years until finally in June, Zan Devine at Miramax gave us the green light and away we went. So it took a lot of tenacity to stick with it. Um, and it took a lot of pack ratism, which is the, um, uh, for some reason, after the movie was done and there were all these various cuts of it while it was before it came out in 1998, I kept all my master tapes and they ended up in a friend's, actually not in a friend's uh, house, but underneath a friend's house in the Hollywood Hills. And so that's where we found some of the missing shots that look like they're underground because they were underground. I made it in the 80s, yes, um, but uh, it was a much different place. It was uh, less of a velvet rope, um, but I did experience that sort of velvet rope action to try to get past the crowd, and I learned how to get into nightclubs when I first moved to New York in the 80s. 
um, via a guy named Kevin Thompson, who was an architect and an old friend of a friend. And he said, you shove your way to the front, act like you can get in, you'll get in. If you can't, then you leave. So I always got in. Um, lost touch with Kevin Thompson 15 years later when I made this movie. He had become a production designer and ended up being the production designer of this movie and building the club in Toronto where we shot it. And did I mention that this was so wonderful? This is the first time I've seen it with an English-speaking audience because I didn't go last night. And although they speak English in Berlin, by a large part, a, a native English-speaking audience, and it was fabulous. You guys were great. Every joke landed. It was so wonderful for me. I thought I was going to sit there for five minutes. I watched the whole movie. So, so thank you for that.